the old gray muzzle tour. And I really want to thank Sharon Tracy, the Southwestern Rottweiler Club, for really organizing this. Paula for uh, giving us the, uh, the place. And Sharon, would you just come up? And I want to just show you. Um, this, is, this is what I will leave behind. And this is what we call our treasure map. Look at that. And wow. So, and so this is a treasure map. Um, Niagara Falls, Mount Rushmore, the Golden Gate Bridge, and of course the Southwestern Rottweiler Club. Oh, oh, the wow. Along, <laughs> along with the faces of each of the treasures that oh. I've met along the way. Oh, cool. So oh, that is for uh, that is for you guys. Awesome. Well, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Club. Okay. That is cool. Thank, thank you so you. much. All right. You're very welcome. We'll have to get that club framed. meeting on Tuesday, so yeah, that'll be good. Did you, did, did, did you, did you sign it? Did you it. sign it? I didn't mm -hmm. sign it. Well, I have to make it sign it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got a Sharpie marker? No, but here's a pen. I do. I have a Sharpie marker. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have Sharpies. Okay. All the tracking. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, so I think that'll be, uh, yeah. that'll... That'll remind us over and over again that we had a nice day today. Yes. So, all right. So, so just a background. Um, I grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I uh, went to uh, undergraduate school at Cornell University. Uh, Thirty-three years ago, I was captain of Cornell's baseball team and and toyed around with a uh, profession in professional baseball. But as soon as you tell the major league scouts that your intention is to go to college for eight years, they kind of lose interest in you. And so, um, so then I said, okay, I'll become a veterinarian. And I became a veterinarian um, because I always had an interest in comparative medicine. This whole idea that pets and people are in the same boat when it comes to health, when it comes to aging and cancer. And I always had an interest in cancer. And in fact, for me, the most fascinating thing in all of biology was this thing called organ preferential metastasis, the idea that 50% of women that die with breast cancer had the spread of the breast cancer to their bones, to their skeleton. And we don't understand that. That's not explainable by anatomy, by lymphatic drainage or anything. And it's been known for a long, long time. In fact, a guy named Stephen Padgett back in the 1880s talked about this seed and soil, and the, and the bones of the woman appeared to be the proper soil for that seed, the breast cancer cell, to then flourish in. And, and my fascination was always, okay, that happens in women, and when dogs get breast cancer, it will spread to their bones. But cats get a highly malignant form of breast cancer, and it almost never goes to their bones. <laughs> now, that's of no interest to veterinarians because it doesn't happen. Right? It's a non it's a non event. To me, it's totally fascinating because I say, can I make a woman's skeleton more like a cat? And if I can, then it's a hostile environment for the spread of breast cancer. So that's what I've always been fascinated in. So this idea that the research we do will is win win. It will benefit pets and it will benefit people. So we're cancer. We're we're cancer researchers. So I I finished veterinary school and uh, and then I be, uh, do training to become a board certified veterinary surgeon at the University of Minnesota, and I do a PhD there and at Mayo Clinic. And what do you think my PhD research is on? Cancer. cancer. Okay. Well, see if. If you get it right, you can leave early. <laughs> but, that, but that's not the right answer, and it was disuse osteoporosis. Disuse osteoporosis is when you're mm -hmm. sick in bed for uh -huh. a period of time, your bone mass goes away. Or if you're an astronaut at zero gravity, oh, yeah. your bone mass goes away. But if you're a bear hibernating, your bone mass doesn't go away because the bear somehow circulates in the bloodstream some sort of factors that maintains bone yep, mass. Yep. See how intriguing Oxygen. comparative medicine is? Whoa. It's really cool. So why was a cancer guy studying disuse osteoporosis? It's because I knew I was interested in trying to figure out why cancer spreads the bone. And it, I figured I'll train and become an expert in bone and cancer because that would be a unique skill set. And so that's, that's why I did that. A little bizarre, but that's what I did. So um, I finished that training, and uh, I, I became a faculty member uh, at, at Purdue University, and I've been there for 22 years now. Um, and I was a practicing surgeon. I, I did a lot of neurosurgery and total hip replacement and all sorts of specialty surgeries. But our research program really was taking off. And in fact, um, I became one of the 100 scientists to plot the U.S. prostate cancer research agenda. Now that might sound really, really weird because why is a veterinarian 
one of the 100 experts in the world on prostate cancer. It's because dogs and men are the two species that get prostate cancer with any frequency whatsoever. Hmm. Not rodents, not zebras. Um, you know, so, so when we were the experts on prostate cancers, the naturally occurring prostate cancers that dogs get, so when we listened more and more to the prostate cancer problem, what became apparent was too many of us in the cancer field were waiting for the house to catch on fire and then trying to dream up some sort of sexy, innovative way to put the fire out. And there wasn't enough effort in prevention. And we said, and we were, we were uh, guilty. We were guilty as charged, right? We were interested in late disease spreading to bone. And, and so we said, we need to retool our whole uh, research uh, thrust and focus on prevention. So then we said, let's see, cancer occurs in old tissues. What do we know about old tissues? And the answer was nothing. Because if you're a cancer scientist, you don't know diddly about aging. And if you're an aging scientist, you don't know diddly about cancer. And I know you're saying, speak into my good ear. But that's the way it is. These are two independent silos. They don't speak to one another very much. Incredible, right? Incredible. Now you understand why some, the progress has been slow in cancer prevention, too slow. So we said, we've got to do something about this. We've got to jump in, kicking and screaming, being dragged into the aging field because we're interested in cancer prevention. And we must be experts in cancer and aging not just cancer, cancer and aging. And then if we want to personalize our results, our, our findings and the findings of others, then we really have a three ring circus, right? We've got cancer, we've got aging, and then we have the communication of health related research, which most scientists are dreadful at. Yes. Okay, so that's what we've set out to do now to train the next generation of scientists to, to play in this three ring circus, <coughs> to be experts in all three of those. And so, now, we, you, I was at Purdue for 12 years, and uh, I had worked with Gerald Murphy. Now, Gerald Murphy was the, the urologist. He was the scientist who headed the team that discovered PSA, the PSA blood test for detection of prostate cancer in men. And Dr. Murphy had a really, really unique setup. He had been the chief medical officer for the American Cancer Society, published 1,200 papers in cancer research. But he went back to the, to the Pacific Northwest where he grew up, and he was the head of a not-for-profit cancer research institute. The, it was called the Pacific Northwest Cancer Foundation. And when I met Dr. Murphy, I thought a not-for-profit raises money and then gives it away to somebody to use. Dr. Murphy's situation was completely different. He wrote this, this not-for-profit research institute, wrote grant proposals. To, to do research and raise money privately through donations to do the research. And I thought that was really, really cool. Well, Dr. Murphy died of a heart attack in 2001, and I got a phone call. Uh, and they said, would you like to be the new director of this research institute? And I said, you know, I'm all wrong for the job. I'm, a, I'm not a 65-year-old urologist. I'm a 45-year-old veterinarian. And they said, that's okay. That's okay. We know that you worked with Dr. Murphy, and Dr. Murphy got this he got the idea of this comparative medicine that, that animals and people are, especially pets, are in the same boat as, uh, as people. So I was a little bit frustrated at Purdue because what's really, really powerful and great about a Research One university is, is also a problem because that university wants to be great at everything, wants the best astronauts and the best sociologists and the best philosophers. I just want to wipe out cancer. And basically what you want to do is you got to get in line, get in line. And I found that very frustrating. And then I thought, wow, wouldn't it be a completely unique opportunity if I could tether and I could pull together, join together what was good and powerful and strong about a Research One university but wasn't focused on anything with a not-for-profit research institute that was focused on something. And that's what I that's what I did. So right now I have a 50% appointment as a professor at Purdue University where I'm associate director of the Center on Aging and I'm also director of the Gerald P. Murphy Cancer Foundation uh, which is now in the Purdue Research Park which is adjacent to the university so I didn't I don't have to keep going back from Indiana to Seattle, Indiana to Seattle and uh, and that's where the Rottweiler longevity work is in the Center for Exceptional Longevity Studies of the Murphy Cancer Foundation. So I have a completely unique situation that I have what I can take what's good about Purdue University 
and then we can focus on what we want to study, and that's cancer and aging within the Murphy Foundation. So it's a completely uh, unique situation. In fact, um, the Murphy Foundation was one of the 400 sites that enrolled 32,000 men in the largest prostate cancer prevention trial ever. And so isn't it cool that a veterinarian could be in charge of that and to, to lead that? And why not? See, in my business, I've got to know prostate cancer in men better than any physician, right? Because I have to know what are the key questions that are bothering people and then say, well, let's design a, an experiment in cell culture in the laboratory to, to analyze that. Or that won't work. We need to do a mouse experiment or a dog experiment or we have to do it in men. So that's my business. So when people say, what are you good at? I say, I'm a pretty good listener because i got to really listen carefully to what are the problems, what are the, the questions that are, that are going on. Okay, so... So now we realize we have to be experts in cancer, both cancer and aging, and so we're getting into the aging field, and we do the first study on the Rottweilers, and it was back in 1999, actually, and we collected data from 800, uh, 800 uh, dogs, 46 states in Canada, and, and why Rottweilers to begin with? Um, we were very interested in osteosarcoma, the bone cancer that is, is dreadful in Rottweilers, and also that's the bone cancer that kills teenagers, mm. right? The number one bone cancer of teenagers is osteosarcoma, same aggressive biological behavior, and, and not very much progress was being made in that. So again, we were interested in how could we prevent osteosarcoma, perhaps. Um, so. We started, we looked, at, we looked at all these data from the Rottweilers, and there were these 21 dogs, and these 21 dogs who had lived to be 13 years of age. And there they were, there they sat, and we were saying, look at this cancer-prone breed. By the way, if Rottweilers die with usual longevity, which is about 8 to 10 years of age, 80% of the time, cancer is the cause of death. Rotties are a cancer-prone breed. I'm preaching to the choir here, right? Right. <laughs> so Rotties are a cancer-prone breed. But what about these 21 dogs that lived to be 13 years of age? They were resistant to cancer. And we said, you know what? It is so very difficult to find cancer-resistant populations. You can find cancer-susceptible populations. We know cancer runs in families, right? And families will get a lot of cancer. Not only will they get a lot of cancer, but they won't wait till 70 to get colon cancer. They'll have colon cancer at 35 years of age. Mm -hmm. They won't have breast cancer. They'll have bilateral breast cancer. So we, we can find cancer-susceptible populations. It's really hard to find cancer-resistant populations. Is this a cancer? Are we a cancer-resistant population? We don't know, right? We have to let it play out. But finally, here, we stumbled upon, no, let's say we were clever, but actually we, we stumbled upon this cancer-resistant population, and it was the oldest old bodies. So, so we said we need to study these guys more carefully, and that's when we started to, to develop the the um, exceptional longevity database where we did that we are the investigators and in first time in the world tracking the oldest living dogs in the United States starting with Rottweilers and uh, and so that's what we developed so so if you look back uh, then we're beginning to study the oldest old we're collecting detailed information many of you have participated uh, through questionnaire and medical record and then fast forward to 2010, and we have about 141 of these dogs in our database. That's 140 more than anybody else has ever studied. But, we have, but we've never met the dogs. I'm at a scientific meeting in, in Florida, and all of a sudden I say, holy crap, you know, if you wanted to really understand uh, and try to advance how to teach kids and help them learn, would you go back to your hotel room and read a book about intelligence, or would you get your butt in a classroom and make first-hand observations on how kids learn? And then we said, man, we got to go and meet these dogs. So I called my research group and I said, where are the dogs that are alive? Now, at any given time, there's about 15 of these dogs sprinkled across the country that we have under surveillance. And so uh, I'm, I spent two days and I called the 15 owners 
Um, and I lined up the first old gray muzzle tour in 2010. I don't think you could line up 15 dentist appointments. As <laughs> yeah. as, as I said, no. uh, how about the 26th of March? Uh, if I'm in Arizona, can I visit you in your home? Yes, yes, yes. And, and it was just, That's so that shows people, the, yeah. and that shows the motivation that shows the motivation and, uh, and the excitement that, that the Roddy owners have. So that was 2010. Now, um, now we fast forward to where we sit today, and uh, we have 241 dogs in our database. Mm. Um, and at the time that we started the Old Gray Muzzle Tour in 2010, we had autopsies on six dogs. Now remember, w the reason that brought us to the Rotties to study the oldest old Rotties is this idea of cancer resistance. Now what do I mean by cancer resistance? What I mean is resistance to cancer mortality. So in other words, resistance to dying of cancer. Because what we're seeing in the autopsy data is that even though only about 20% of these Rotties that live to be 13 years of age have cancer as a cause of death, more than 95% of them have cancer at the time of autopsy. In fact, they have sometimes two, three, four different cancers. I didn't say osteosarcoma that spread to four different organs. I said lymphoma, bladder cancer, melanoma, and a, and a heart-based tumor, four independent primaries. So what I just told you is these oldest old Rotties hold the key to what every cancer scientist is trying to figure out. How can we transform cancer from lethal disease to this nuisance, this non-lethal nuisance? I say, let's make cancer athlete's foot. We'll all walk around with a little bit of it. <laughs> and if somebody comes up to you and they're a cancer researcher and says, hey, I'm a cancer researcher and you should invest in my work because I'm going to prevent all cancer from happening, you should really be suspicious because we're air-breathing mammals and we live a long time, and that means cancer is going to be with us. I'm telling you our objective is we think, learning from the Rotties, whatever they're going to teach us, that we may be able to make cancer a non-lethal disease and we'll all walk around with it. So that's our objective, not to prevent cancer from happening, but I think a more realistic objective and an, an achievable goal will be to, to remove or significantly reduce cancer mortality. So, um, so the, now I'm gonna tell two quick stories, okay? Um, the first one is the story of how come a cancer researcher is studying aging, and I think you already understand that, right? That that we Excuse we me, have to go take care of this. cancer happens in old tissues, and so you have to. We think the breakthroughs in cancer prevention research are going to come from understanding the aging process, because I think the aging process and the cancer process are going to share some things, and so we need to study that in great detail, and so. One of the big priorities is this autopsy study. In 2010, before the Old Gray Muzzle Tour, we had autopsies on six dogs. We now have autopsies on 63 of these mm. long-lived Rotties. All 12 of the dogs that I've met on the tour, the owners have consented to autopsy. And the two other dogs that are alive in the country that I've already met have already consented. And so we have 75, we have 77 autopsies now lined up. That's so critical because without the autopsy, we're guessing, right? Because you, we, look at, we look at the dog and the dog has never been diagnosed with cancer during her life or his life, and we say, oh, that dog's cancer-free. No, from our experience, those dogs are harboring cancer. And so we need the autopsy. It's critical for us to be able to say that's the truth in terms of the tumor burden. And... Uh, and then we've also established the first biorepository, not only of these tissues, but also of blood samples, DNA, and, and so forth, so that 10 years from now, when we have a great idea about, when we, when we find a marker in blood that would tell us that a particular dog or a particular person had a highly successful aging trajectory or were on a rotten trajectory, and, if, and we can just thaw out Kara's blood sample or Cannon's blood sample and, and analyze that and test that. So a little piece of immortality for the, for the dogs. So that's the one story. The second story is that um, two and a half weeks ago, I, on, as part of the tour, I gave a talk at the medical school at University of Kentucky, and the, the title of that talk was 
generating scientific hypotheses from the living room. Now, that sounds like a bizarre title to go and speak at a medical school to mm -hmm. a bunch of people who have never been in anybody's uh, living room generating scientific hypotheses. They lock, lock themselves in the laboratory. And what I was trying to challenge those young scientists to think about is the, this idea that there is no substitute for firsthand observations. If they're studying heart failure, they can't lock themselves in the laboratory and do experiments with the molecules that they think are responsible. They have to get out and make some first-hand observations and see heart failure. And, and in that way, they're going to come up with new ideas. And, and it's, the story, it's the story of we knew so much about the oldest old dogs, yet we hadn't gone out and met them. And because they're sprinkled across the United States and they're not within a 50-mile radius of my veterinary teaching hospital, there was no way that I could say, here, drive your dog 350 miles. It's like saying, get great-grandma, the 102-year-old, in the car for a road trip and come to my teaching hospital, and then I'll spend 15 minutes with her in the exam room in this totally artificial situation and then try to make sense of it. Instead, we needed to get out and, and be in the living room, and, and that's what the Old Gray Muzzle Tour is. This trip and, and the other dogs I've met, I spend about four hours. I do detailed physical exam and ask a lot of questions about the dogs' lives. Now, one of the sets of questions that I asked uh, on the first Old Gray Muzzle Tour was, okay, so is your dog frightened by loud noises like gunshot or thunderstorm or whatever? No, don't seem to be stressed out by that. Okay, so how about uh, going to the veterinarian? Is that stressful? No, not really. Okay, how about strange people in the house? No, not really. Okay, so what is stressful to your dog? And some of the owners would be thinking for a long, long time and say, well, I don't think he really likes hot air balloons. You know, so they really had to reach, they really had to reach to find something that stressed out their dog. So, so now it's kind of intuitive that an organism, whether that's a dog or a person, that is highly successfully aging. Remember, we're studying highly successful aging. If you want to understand creativity, study extreme creativity, not the average creative person. Study extreme creativity. We reason the same way. If you want to understand successful aging, you study extremely successful aging. And that's what these guys are, right? They live 30% longer than the average uh, for their breed. So I guess it's intuitive to say maybe those animals, those people who are highly successfully aging, handle stress in a positive way. Maybe that, that sounds about right. But you know what we were able to do? we were able to then test that idea and, and measure stress hormone in these dogs. And no easy trick to, across the country, in 28 of these dogs, actually measure cortisol levels, the stress hormone level in the blood, and then do one other clever thing, and that is to, to challenge the dogs. Give the dogs a small amount of ACTH, that's the pituitary hormone that triggers the adrenal gland to release cortisol. Remember, this is all part of an ACTH stem test. If you know Cushing's disease and Addison's disease, this is the test that veterinarians use every day, day after day. But we did that, and what did we find? Now let me back up. What do we know about stress and aging? Well, if you're a rat, if you're a dog, if you're a baboon, or if you're a person, as you age, your cortisol levels go up in your blood. We, mm. As we age, we walk around with higher stress hormone levels. Mm. Doesn't matter if you're rat, dog, a baboon, or, or a person. Okay, so now here's the questions we asked. We're gonna study this in ancient dogs. Will the cortisol level be elevated? I guess it would be reasonable to say ancient dogs would really, really have high cortisol levels. And we want to say, are the, is the response to the ACTH challenge, is that youthful response retained? Or do they have an old, lazy response? And what did we find in 28 dogs? None of the dogs had elevated stress hormone levels. None of them. All of them sidestep that. And in fact, 40% of the dogs are actually walking around with low stress hormone levels. Now, if we hadn't done our clever challenge, then the logical interpretation would be, they're ancient dogs, their adrenal glands are wearing out, that's why they're so low. No, those 40% of dogs are walking around with low basal cortisol levels, 
but retain a youthful response to challenge. Now look, if you want to win a 100 mile race, you don't sprint it, right? You don't sprint it. And in fact, if you're 70 years old, you don't need the adrenal drive of a 30 year old, right? What you would do is cool down the machine to make it that 100 year trek. But you would want to retain youthful response to challenge. When you needed it, you could respond. And that's what these dogs have apparently figured out. So for the first time in mammals, we've shown this. And we're going to present these data at an international congress in, in South Korea in June if there's no war. I was just going to say, get bombed. Yeah, right. But we're scheduled to do location. that. So, so, so I think that, that probably Plan deserves B. some yeah, uh, yeah. clapping because, because there's the oldest old Roddies that, that – by generating a hypothesis in the living room, by going and meeting these dogs, you generate a new idea and you show something absolutely unique in science. And remember, how do we benchmark our progress in science? It's by the questions we ask, the new questions. You ask a smarter group of questions. Because now, once we now once we've demonstrated this, now we can ask the question. Wow, how can we all sidestep elevated cortisol levels? Nobody's asking that question before because we think we know, K-N-O-W, that aging and elevated stress hormone levels are inextricably linked, right? In other words, elevated stress hormone levels are an obligate part of aging, and that's what our data now is calling into question. So... So I, I, what I've told you is two stories about the progress, about the amazing possibilities both in cancer and stress. You might say, two cool stories, right? And I might say to you, are they really two stories or are they one story? Because we know that elevated cortisol levels in rodents accelerate tumor growth. So maybe, just maybe, these will soon merge into one fantastic story. But regardless, regardless, it's... Uh, uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, hopefully uh, that's why we're here. You guys are inspired by this work, and, and uh, you want us to keep going. So uh, we're doing something completely unique that nobody else is uh, doing, and there's a big payoff. And the payoff <laughs> is for the Rotties, the payoff is for other breeds, and the payoff transcends dogs to, uh, to our own health. If you haven't heard the term health span before, that's the term that you're going to hear a lot of. It used to be in aging research. We should work hard to try to tack on more years of life. And now that's been changed to say, no, we need to increase the number of healthy, independent years. That's healthy longevity, health span. And that's really the, the business we're in. Okay, so there's my introduction and two stories. And so that, I think, gave you enough to... Uh, Provoke you, you, you have more, lots more stories out of four. <laughs> I told you everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> but cortisol, cortisol study oh. question. Yep. Um, in, in your old muzzle group, mm -hmm. you um, tested, the, the, was there a subset of, yes, my dog really is stressed by a lot of these different things. And then there was the other group that said, ah, I can't really think of anything. So were the results the same? Was, getting a low cortisol okay, level. Okay, does everybody understand the, yeah. the question and understand the question? The, the question goes... Was there a stressful dog in that group? <laughs> Thank you. She's clairvoyant. Mm -hmm. she's or going, psycho. She's going in the car with me on the way. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay, so I'll, re I'll, I'll kind of re reframe the question. And the question was, have we looked at and compared the, the oldest old Rotties that seem to be stress-free or stress-avoiding, and those dogs that seem stressed out by gunshot or whatever. The answer to that question is there's so few dogs that are stressed out by things that we really haven't been able to evaluate that yet. But that's a great question. So now see, all these questions you're going to ask me, I'm going to keep saying to you, now pat yourself on the back, because, see, nobody's asking that question yeah. before the new research now changes the thinking 
and now that becomes a very good question and an important question. Because maybe now those five dogs are the ones you need to be yeah. looking at. So, so now let me let me just say what we have studied. Now remember, everything I'm telling you, we haven't published or anything. Yeah. I mean, nobody else in the world really knows this. We're just talking here. Um, but that's what's exciting about my job because I get to sit around the table and talk to my research group about these things, and it's really quite cool. One of the things that we have done is um, when I visit dogs, um, and even some of the dogs that I haven't visited, one of my colleagues, Dr. Maris, who's a veterinarian, every six weeks is on the phone with the owners and asks a series of questions. And what we're getting at is we're trying to calculate what's called a frailty burden. Mm -hmm. Now, frailty index is something in people that's been used that if I ask questions about your mobility, your cognitive function, your hearing, your eyesight, your strength, I can make predictions on how long you will live independently, how long you live in people. There's no such thing in veterinary medicine right now. There is no such thing as a frailty index, and so we're trying to develop one. And so the coolest part is that Dr. Maris does this over the telephone with the owner with a series of questions. And now when I go into the homes and visit the dogs, I'm the gold standard, right? I do the detailed physical exam. I meet the dog and I can see, okay, how well does this dog see? Do you can you catch, I videotape, can okay. you catch treats from here? Or can you catch treats from here? Do you bump oh, into do you bump into furniture and dim light and so on and so forth? So I'm the gold standard that enables us to do it. Well, the only reason I'm talking about the frailty index is that group that has the low cortisol levels has lower frailty. Mm. And now we don't know what the deal is exactly, but here's what we would postulate that if we were able to evaluate all of these Rottweilers early enough when they had less frailty, there a lot more of the dogs would have this lower cortisol. And as the dogs get more frail, you can imagine, if you have to work harder every time you get up, you have to work harder to maintain your balance on a slippery floor. I guess your cortisol levels might go up a little bit, right? Okay, but see, these dogs don't go high, they go into the normal range. We're guessing, right? Mm -hmm. We're guessing about this but it's very, very intriguing, right? So that this idea, see the scientific term for this is low basal cortisol into phenotype. All right, good, you'll never remember that <laughs> because that's not people speak, right? But that's what we're talking about. And we think it's, we've shown it in 40% of the dogs. We think that's, that at a, at a certain time during their life, it's even higher than that. Have you thought about doing 12 year old dogs? Why, what do you thir mean doing? why 13? <laughs> why 13? Starting them in the study to do so you might be able to find them. Um, did everybody hear the question about yeah. um, 12 years old? Um, you know, we, we have a group of dogs that we've studied at all different ages, what we call our continuous cohort, the dogs that have died from anywhere from four years of age through 13 years of age. And we study them and we look at them for certain things. But the 13-year-old dogs are equivalent to 100-year-old people. And remember, when we publish our data, we're not going to publish our data in Joe Blow Veterinary Journal. Right. Right. We have to publish it in a tip-top aging journal. So, for example, let me ask you a question. So, how many scientific journals do you think there are in the world that focus on gerontology and aging? Five. Okay, there are 57. Oh, wow. There are 57 different journals. When we published our data in, in the Rotties showing that females outlive males, and if you take the ovaries away in the first four years, you erase the female survival advantage. We published that in the journal Aging Cell, which is the top impact of all 57. So that's what we must do, right? We must, we must publish in the highest echelon journals because we need to convince other scientists that what we're doing in the Rottweiler is very valuable. That's how we maintain the funding mm -hmm. and so forth for our, uh, our research. So, so it seems to be working because I'm the National Academy of Sciences and Keck um, selected 120 scientists to have a think tank about how can we push healthy longevity in people. 
and I'm one of the 120 scientists, mm. the only veterinarian. I'm one of the 62 fellows in the biology of aging in the Gerontology Society of America, the only veterinarian and one of the 62 experts in aging on the world. Let me just say this. No veterinarians are trained in the biology of aging as part of their DVM curriculum. It doesn't matter if they went to Davis or Cornell mm -hmm. like myself 30 years ago, one year ago. It's, uh, it's, it's a problem because as our research comes out, other research on aging that is inevitably going to come out, how well equipped is the veterinary profession to discuss or debate the issues? They don't even know the words. They don't even know the words, right? Don't think of language as how we communicate. Language is how we think. If veterinarians don't know the words heterogeneity, plasticity, antagonistic pleiotropy, they can't think about it. They can't debate it or discuss it. That's problematic. So what have we done? We've designed the first gerontology training program for veterinarians, postgraduate veterinarians, mm -hmm. to come to the Center for Exceptional Longevity Studies and do a three-day cook-down version of course, the graduate course that I've taught for the last 13 years. <coughs> But you can see we're, so when we say, look at all this new research and isn't it cool, how long is it going to take for it to be adopted by the veterinary profession? In many cases, a long, long time. We can expect it to be a long, long time because we, we have a uphill battle. It's, it's hard to do research these days because it's hard to get funding, but we have the research, but we also have the education. And in fact, I wrote a paper um, here based on a keynote talk that I gave um, last year called Creative Excellence in the Research Hyphen Education Space. And, and stop thinking about, well, do you teach or do research? No, no, no. Think of research hyphen education space. It's linked. If you do research, if you're a discoverer, you then are obligated to educate your colleagues and the public. That's how you have impact. That's hard to do, isn't it? Because what you want to do is you make the exciting finding and you want to go right back in the laboratory and follow that up with the next exciting finding. So it's like we're on double duty and there's only so many hours. There's only so much energy. There's only so, so much hours in the day. Yes. So that was going to be my question, which is how accepting is, has the medical community been? Like, when you're going to these conferences, when you're going to Korea, <coughs> and you're with all these doctors, is it, are they becoming more open-minded to it? Are they respecting it? What is it? Them? What is it? Open-minded. What's it. just your, the findings that you're, you're, you're coming uh, the, Okay. So, all right. So, again, I'll reframe the question, and I think everybody heard it. So, I'm going to try to address, I'm going to try to define it as two different things. It being the use of Rottweilers as teachers. And then I'm going to say the specific findings, okay? Um, the National Academy of Sciences came to me and said, we're publishing a special issue of this journal on animal models of human health span that we think are highly interesting. Uh, we've done this 13 years ago, and dog wasn't on the radar screen, wasn't part of it, <laughs> not mentioned. And because of your work, we want you to write the piece in this. So again, here we can clap because, yes. because that's, raw, that's based upon the Rottweiler wow. work. So people are seeing that. The fact that we could publish our paper in Aging Cell, the, the number one out of 57 journals says, yes, we're really, really highly respected. And this whole idea of taking aging research, doing aging research in a different way, taking it out of the ivory tower and into the living room, is a really, really cool concept. I mean, we call it, we're studying aging in place. Yeah, as opposed to here, an old person comes in, uh, to a clinic and gets a 15 minute exam and you're trying to figure out uh, how to personalize the wellness and what kind of trajectory that person's on. So, so it's hard to do, it's hard to do. It's no surprise to me that we're the only ones doing it. I mean, think about it for a minute. Adrenal testing, 28 dogs nationwide. The blood has to be handled in a very, very careful way. Uh, the dogs have to be tested all at the same time in the morning because mm. there are circadian rhythms and in, in, uh, cortisol levels. I mean, this is no easy trick. It's a tribute to we're in the relationships business, relationships with pet owners and relationships with a network of veterinarians throughout the country. Um, let's talk about the receptivity to some of the results and maybe we talk about the ovary story, for example. If you ask me, I'm a board-certified veterinary surgeon, 
And I can tell you how I was trained, spay dogs early to try to eliminate breast cancer. That's what, you, that's what you're supposed to do. It's based on a 40-year-old study that is a good study that showed if we spay early, we can decrease the occurrence of breast cancer. Okay, so now when we start studying aging, and we have no ax to grind about the early space story. We have no ax to grind whatsoever. But we take a look at our data, and we're scientists, and we're saying, what seems to be associated with exceptional longevity? And we say, wow, there's a girl dog advantage. Again, if you ask me 10 years ago, do girl dogs live longer than boy dogs? I'd say, I don't really appreciate that. And I think most veterinarians would say that, hmm. OK? So now we say. There's a girl dogs are twice as likely to reach exceptional longevity than the boy dogs. And, uh, and, and what do we know from scientists that study 100-year-old people? That ratio is 4 to 1. 4 to 1 women to men reach 100. What about the scientists that study super centenarians, 110-year-old people, 20 to 1 women to men? Mm. So there's this female longevity advantage, but we don't understand the biology of it. We don't understand the underlying thing. Again, here, here are the Roddies that will help try to define that. But then when we look very, okay, so now you find a girl dog advantage. It doesn't take Einstein to look at, okay, what about ovaries? Right. How long they keep ovaries? And you know what we did? We did something that no one had ever done before. And we measured, we looked at the association between how long the dogs live and the number of years of ovary exposure. Oh, that sounds very clever. I don't know. That sounds straightforward to me. But let me say this. In the veterinary scientific literature, there have been two studies ever published on spaying and longevity. Both of them use this silly compartmentalization, which I call dichotomous binning. You categorize all the dogs in your study as spayed or intact at the time of death. You ignore how long they've had ovaries during their lifetime. Now. And, and, and now, let me, make, let, me, let me do this. Could an intelligent person distort or misinterpret the relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer? I'll show you how. I sneak into a nursing home, and I find a guy, and I say, do you have lung cancer? And he says, yes. I said, do you smoke now? He says, I'm on oxygen therapy. If I smoke now, I'd blow myself up. <laughs> So then I write in my notebook, lung cancer, yes, smoking, no. And now I go down the hallway, and I do it again and again and again and again. The guy had 30 years of smoking, and I missed it. And that's what I think our profession, the veterinary profession, has distorted this whole relationship between yeah. spaying. So here's the scenario. Rottweiler, bitch, reaches 10 years of age, is spayed, lives to be 13 and a half. We're really excited. Dog dies, spayed or intact. Spayed. spayed. See, those spayed dogs live longer. In my experience, <laughs> the spayed female, oh, for God's sake, 10 years yeah, of overexposure. Please. Now, what kind of pushback do you think you get on that? Whoa, <laughs> that flies countercurrent to conventional wisdom in veterinary medicine. But you know what? When we submitted our paper for publication in Aging Cell, we're waiting for the reviewer's uh, decision. And out pops a paper in obstetrics and gynecology. Maybe you read it. 29,000 women by William Parker, actually in California, that underwent hysterectomy. About half of them kept their ovaries, and half the women lost their ovaries. And what was the result? Women should keep their ovaries for the first 50 years because it lowers their overall mortality, cardiovascular mortality, even lowers their risk for lung cancer. What the heck is that? Ovaries and lung cancer? OK, that just shows what we know K-N-O-W, almost nothing. I tell my research group, let's stop using the K-N-O-W word. Let's say we believe, we understand. You don't need to use that word because we know almost nothing. And in fact, you act on what you believe, not what you know. You bought the car today because you believe it's the best car for you. You don't know it's the best car for you. So stop saying, I'll have to wait for that randomized clinical trial. I'll have to wait for more information because we don't know. For God's sake, you don't have to be paralyzed just because you don't know. If you understand and you believe strongly enough, you will act. And then, based upon those actions, you'll say, well, 
Does that reinforce my belief or undermine my belief? And if it reinforces your belief, you'll probably continue to act that way. If it undermines, then you say, wait a minute, I've got to step back from this, and I've got to try to understand this a little bit better. So now, I take a trip to Mayo Clinic, and I'm going to meet Walter Rocca. Walter Rocca is the physician who's doing research on this same issue in a big cohort of women up at Mayo Clinic who have undergone hysterectomy and either kept their ovaries or lost their ovaries. In his data set, if women lose their ovaries before age 37, they triple their risk for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. so, there, so the message to women, keep your ovaries. Okay, so now I'm preparing to meet and have lunch with Walter Rocca and I'm, and I'm writing in my composition book and I'm thinking, okay, so now what question do I want to make sure that I ask him before I leave? And I say, I'm gonna ask him what kind of pushback he's getting with these days. Yeah. So we sit down to lunch and he's opening up his beverage and he's sitting down and he says, Dave, you wouldn't believe the pushback I'm getting on these, on these results. I said, brother, you know, because, <laughs> because, because his findings fly countercurrent to 40 years worth of OBGYN. Look, new research, new research results challenge old ideas. And look, we're the first to study exceptional longevity. No one has ever done it before, the oldest old dogs. We're the first to look at number of years of overexposure. And when we find a new result, is that expected or unexpected? It's an expected result. If you do something differently, that you would find a new result. Now, does it make any sense? Of course it does, because ovaries are not just reproductive units. They're endocrine organs. What does endocrine mean? Endocrine means you produce stuff, i.e. hormones, that have system-wide effects. That's what ovaries do. If I said to you, I got a great idea, let me rip your thyroids out. You say, <laughs> get away from me. They're endocrine organs. They produce hormones that have system-wide effects. Okay, wait a minute. Then why do we rip ovaries, endocrine organs, out of young mammals? And we say, it's health-promoting. Well, that's because that's how we've been trained. That's how I was trained. Now, do I still believe the breast cancer protection story? Absolutely, but listen carefully. We study longevity as an endpoint, not breast cancer occurrence. So what does longevity in, in, integrate? The risk of getting breast cancer, getting pyometra, getting every other disease, the risk of dying of breast cancer, dying of pyometra, the risk of dying of every other disease, and the rate of aging. It's the ultimate integrated biomarker. And now we say, after all of these competing trade-offs and the dust settles, keeping ovaries are an advantage. You don't want to lose the ovaries early if you're a Roddy or a woman. Oh, by the way, we published our paper in Aging Cell, and now out pops another paper, and it's in the Journal of Gerontology, and it's a mouse study. It's a mouse study. And what they, it's a transplantation study, and what they did in that study is they take old female mice, and then they take young mouse ovaries, and they transplant them into the old female mm. mice, mm. and they push longevity by 15%. Mm. Wow. So now you have, in a six-month period of time, three investigators, three different species, the information all converging on this new idea that ovaries are part of a system that promotes longevity. No, they'd be the same for intact males. Okay, so the question. <laughs> there we go. So the question is, what about a male story? You there know, we go. I wish we had a male story, and we don't have a male story yet because we don't have as many males. But I think we should have a male story probably by the fall. What do, What do you guys think the results of the male study are going to be? If we remove uh, testes, gonads early, is that better for males? Who Who says that? Who votes that? Maybe it might lower their stress level, though. Okay. All right. So, so, so now. Because they're not okay, looking maybe. at the okay. females. All right. Okay. So, who says keeping the gonads around longer will benefit the male? Okay. A few people. I and would. Who says it's a wash? It's not going to matter. I don't know that it's a wash. No. That's where I am. Uh, I'll, I'll bet. I I'll bet you dinner. I'll bet you dinner. I'll bet you dinner. It's a wash, and I can. Do you want me to tell you why? Why? Yeah. Here's, here's why I think. Well, you're getting dinner, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> right, 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 right. You gotta bet something else. Well, yeah, I right. dinner some other time. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, so here's why I think. Um, if you're a dog or a person, um, the female 
walking around with intact ovaries is the most resilient, the most advantaged organism. So give yourselves a hand, ladies. Yay. Congratulations. Yay. Girl power, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's the most resilient and advantaged organism. When you take ovaries away from that organism, you disadvantage them. And you disadvantage her significantly enough that we can see it. Albeit, it's been a long time for us to really see it. But we're beginning to see it. So that's why I think that we see that disadvantage. Males, on the other hand, I don't think are very advantaged. So, so, and, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm serious about this, this. I think this is my view of biology right now. I wouldn't have been able to say this five years ago, but this is my emerging view, that I think males are not all that advantaged, and when you take their gonads away, you're only going to diminish them a little so little that we won't be able to detect it unless we study 20,000 males. Yeah. Then we'll say, see that difference? So that's why I'm in the camp. And look, I can write the story whichever way it goes. Whatever the data are, they are, right? Data's plural, by the way, not datum, yes. right? Whatever the data are, they are. So, so could you write a story that getting rid of those gonads early is advantageous? Maybe decrease the stress level. Yeah. Okay? How about keeping gonads around a longer time? How would that be beneficial? Well, that's more natural for the organism. I say I'm in the it's going to be a wash camp. I, 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 I think that we don't have a big enough window when we, when we castrate males, we don't disadvantage them enough that we will be able to see the difference. Now, let's go back to the female, and let's go back to the implications of the work, because right away you say, wow, Dr. Waters' research on ovaries is really, really cool. That could really benefit women. And I say, well, that's really short-sighted thinking, because I think it can benefit women and men. There can be a payoff here, because I believe in what's called complementarity in biology. That means that if there's a really important thing going on in an organism, there are multiple ways to achieve it. And so the way I'm thinking is, here's this female who is disadvantaged because she loses her ovaries. I don't have to give her ovaries back. I don't have to give her estrogens back. I can do other things to re-advantage her. Hmm. That's complementarity. I know there's lots of people that don't think that way because they think we took the ovaries away and therefore we have to give back estrogens. Estrogens are going to be too toxic, I think, and I believe in complementarity. So antioxidants, exercise, something in the diet, meditation, whatever. I think those things can potentially re-advantage the female. I agree. Now, if we can understand what are the ovary-sensitive steps in the process, then we create what are called ovarian mimetics. In other words, things that I can give you, a pill. You'll brush your teeth and you'll take one of these pills. It's mimicking what the ovary would do that is advantageous to longevity. And men will be able to take that ovarian mimetic. It's not going to be an estrogen. It's not going to be an estrogen. So maybe there's a payoff. But before we skip and the, we end with the, with the ovary story, what does this all mean? In the not too distant future, maybe 10 years from now or 15 years from now, 35-year-old women will have a laparoscopic procedure and will have one of their ovaries scooped down and frozen. Oh. Maybe it's your daughter or your granddaughter. And then at 45, she'll get a slice of her own ovary to rejuvenate. And at 55, she'll get a slice of her own ovary to rejuvenate. And at 65, a slice of her own ovary. Is that possible? Yeah, that's yeah. possible. That's like the stem cell um, in rodents, situation. In rodents, huh? in rodents, they've shown that they can cryopreserve ovaries and then thaw them out and put them back in, and they're viable. So, so that oh. technology is available. And the question is, is could we do that? Yeah, I think, I think that's reasonable. But I think uh, what our work now is trying to do, so again, nobody's asking the question, what's the optimal number of years of overexposure to optimize longevity? before our work, because they're asking a stupid question. Is spaying good or bad? Mm. Either orness, good or bad, gets us in trouble. Am I smart right. or dumb? Yeah. Handsome or ugly? <laughs> Whatever, that gets us in trouble. Right. Stop doing either orness and say, under what situations would spaying be a health-promoting procedure? If you're a miniature poodle that has a sky-high risk of breast cancer, 
I think maybe you want the ovaries out early. I think probably if you're a woman with BRCA1 mutations, which predispose you to ovarian cancer, you're going you're gonna to have your ovaries removed at the time of hysterectomy. But stop this one-size-fits-all knee-jerk here. We're just going to do this. We're going to rip ovaries out of young mammals. It doesn't make sense anymore. But you know what? We're products, no, victims of our own training. Me, me included. And now let's say one other thing, and then I'm going to answer your question. If she has a question, I have a question. But let me just say one other thing. Let's go back to ask me 10 years ago. Do I think girl dogs outlive boy dogs? And I would say, not in my experience. And most veterinarians would say that. Well, of course they would, because they spay dogs early. And they remove the female survival advantage. So they homogenize the whole population. And then you ask them, well, do girls live longer than boys? And they say no. So it makes complete sense. It makes complete sense why it's been hidden, right? Because as soon as you, as soon as you see this new finding that is countercurrent, you say, could that really be true? Well, ovaries are endocrine organs, and this, this female survival advantage, I think, is real. You know, if we take a look at the Rotties, in our database of 241 dogs, we have 20 that have lived to be 15. 17 females, three males. Okay, so now you say, oh, this female thing, I don't know, this is, this is just strength. Oh, come on. It's real. It's real. And, and I tell people, why should you believe our ovary data? Because we have no ax to grind. We didn't, we didn't jump in this because we're sensitive to the pet overpopulation issue right. or, or we're, we want to battle with the AVMA on early spay, neuter, or whatever. We, didn't, we, have no, we have no investment in that. We're scientists for the first time studying exceptional longevity, and we're seeing things that nobody else has seen, and we're reporting them as faithfully as we can. Forgive my medical ignorance on this, but when they spay a bitch, can they leave the ovaries in like they do on a woman? Yeah, so everybody heard the question. So, mm -hmm. so um, it's called ovary conserving hysterectomy. There would be other names for it, but that's probably about as good a term as any. Ovary conserving hysterectomy, where you would just remove the yeah. uterus. Yes. Um, one of the celebration stops we did uh, on the tour in Wisconsin uh, is uh, with, at a, a veterinary practice uh, owned by Marty Greer, who is a reproductive specialist. She does ovary conserving hysterectomy wow. already because her clients are demanding that. What I would envision. Ramification? Is there a yeah. good reason or a bad? I mean, okay, so here's my answer to that. I don't know. No. Veterinarians are not trained to do it. Why would they be oh. trained to do such a thing? Why would they be trained to do such a thing? We love spaying. As, as a veterinary profession. But we if love spaying. Those... It's health promoting, right? That's what we've been told. That's what I've been told. That's what I've been told, so you do it. So, so now, again, how long will it take? And I've talked to lots of people about this, and there are a lot of optimists in the world that say, oh, this is going to change around really fast, young veterinarians. I just, got, I just got an email from a veterinarian in Georgia, and she said to me, my practice is really, my practice is really booming. And I'm now looking for a, a, uh, a part-time veterinarian. And I need to, I, what's so hard to do is to find a veterinarian who doesn't want to just rip ovaries out of 15-pound and 20-pound dogs. They don't want to do the, the spay on the 70-pound Rottweiler at six years of age or whatever. They want to do it in the 30-pounder in the or whatever. So, the ram so I envision that, I'll say soon, which means within the next 10 years, um, in each major city, or I'm sorry, in each large veterinary practice, there will be at least one veterinarian who will feel very comfortable and skilled in doing ovary conserving hysterectomy. I think I think that's probably what you will see. Yes. Uh, um, it seems to me you've got a politically correct element that you mentioned in terms of this pressure to cure overpopulation by Spain earlier and earlier and earlier, and I've had arguments with different veterinarians who want to do the spay. I mean, a dog who goes in for X surgery and the vet wants to spay at the time because they were taught that it is right. We're victims. Rip out the the nice word is product. The real word is victim. We're victims of our own training. Mm -hmm. We're victims of our own training. 
And remember what I said about, so what, what I talk about is tuba, if you want to remember a musical instrument, toward understanding, belief, and action. And this, is, again, is what we were talking about. This is a non-knowing, non-paralysis model of action. You don't need to know anything. You just need to believe strongly enough that you can act. And the question is, why do veterinarians believe what they believe? Because it's what they've been trained. And now, let's take a page out of information theory. I don't know if you know very much about information theory. But there's this concept called landscape ruggedness that is a very, very interesting concept. So when a subject matter is very simple, envision walking along sand dunes. That's the simplicity of the subject. So you're very willing to step out and explore a little bit. Because you're not going to all of a sudden fall down in a hole and be in an extremely worse place. Okay? But now, when the topic, when the subject becomes very complex, now it's like Bryce Canyon hoodoos. And what you've done is you've positioned yourself on top of one of them. And if you take one step off, you have the risk of being in a completely worse place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I told you, veterinarians aren't trained in the biology of aging. They're not endocrinologists. They're not hormone experts. So this whole idea of spaying and longevity is a complex topic. So when you're in a complex, rugged landscape, you mimic. You don't explore. You mimic. So you do what the other guy's doing. You ask the guy at the bowling alley, so what supplement do you take uh, for your prostate? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. And then you do that. You don't do research on prostate because it's too complex. And so, so again, <laughs> you see how information yeah. theory helps us with this? And that's why I'm, I'm delighted to hear the optimism of some people. Oh, this is going to turn right around. We're going to have new veterinarians, and, and they're open-minded and all that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, I think it's going to take a long, long time because it's deep. It, it's very deeply rooted, rooted. and and this whole the pet overpopulation thing is is a different issue, but it always sneaks in. Mm -hmm. It always sneaks in, and and then people stop listening, and then it gets shrill and 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 whatever. Again, I would say to you, I think you, you should trust what we're doing because I think you've met me here briefly and you understand that. We think in a very careful and and uh, as savvy a way as we possibly can. We're we're not going to publish a paper in the top echelon aging journal in the world, and it's going to be crap, is it? Yeah. I mean, it can't it can't possibly be right. And so, so you should believe the ovary story that we did because we had no preconceived notion <laughs> about it. We, we there there was no bias going in. Gav, yes. I have like maybe now three questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm still holding my well, two. Well, one of them is, how long has it been in the veterinarian practice now that they've been pushing spay and neutering? Because it seems to me like, say, in the 70s or maybe, say, 80s, they really were pushing it. Do you think they spayed early? The veterinarians were required back then. That's when the cancer rate started going up. Because they started spaying a lot more. Where old, back then, in the 50s and 60s, dogs were left intact. They were not spayed. Yeah, like they are in Europe. I mean, the, and so they don't have the cancer rate as high. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know. Or we just do. didn't know that they died of cancer. They, they uh, just we just figured they died. Uh, the study the, the study on breast cancer was published in 1968 in oh, the old. Journal on National Cancer Institute. So, and that was uh, again, it, I, it's a very nice study. It's a very believable study. But remember this, guys. If you're going to enhance your health and optimize your health, please don't create your wellness regimen based upon your attempt to avoid getting one disease. <laughs> okay? Yeah. That makes no sense. If I said to you, I've got this intervention, look at this, I've got this intervention in my hand that can lower your risk for breast cancer, but it triples your Alzheimer's disease rate. Yeah. Who wants it? Who wants it? <laughs> Not me. Okay. Not me. Okay. Not me. Okay, but wait a minute. That's what we've done. We've done based upon a study that says Spain can almost eliminate the occurrence of one disease. Again, I believe the study. It's a good study. But now, if, if you have a more sophisticated whole organism thinking and realize that there are trade-offs, then you say, wow, longevity is an endpoint. That's the risk for getting every disease, dying of that disease, and the rate of aging combined. Wow.
that's a powerful endpoint. And now that's what we're doing with the Rotties. We're saying what predicts highly successful aging. Okay, now of all the 13-year-old dogs that you have, or 13, 15, 16, whatever, how many of those females have had puppies and, and not had puppies during their okay. lifetime? So everybody heard the question. The girl. Everybody heard the question. Because that makes you wonder if having puppies or not. I mean, it, maybe it rises something during yeah, so their... so we have a paper that will be published in a week, maybe. Mm. Aha, uh, good on, girl. On this, <laughs> on this subject, because the, a very, very simple explanation for our observed results that females that keep their ovaries longer are more likely to live longer is that it's females who keep their ovaries longer are have more litters and are under the influence of gestational hormones yeah. or there's something about mothering or yeah. something okay yeah. that's that would be a simple explanation so we looked at that and found that independent of number of litters, number of pups, age at right. first reproduction, age at last reproduction, it's ovaries. How long the female keeps ovaries. So it's it not didn't make a difference. Of reproduction. Okay. And remember, it, it's very interesting. I won't bore you with it, but but from an evolutionary from an I don't think we're bored. From, no. an, ev <laughs> bored. from an evolutionary okay. standpoint, the question is an important one because because you say Reproduction may come at a cost, a longevity cost, because as the mother invests more and more in offspring, right. she's investing less and less in herself, and maybe that has a longevity cost. That's been shown, by the way, in fruit flies and in women. In, uh, in a study long of British aristocracy, you know, medical records from the year 1000 to like 1400 or whatever. Okay, but now there's another issue, and the other issue is women who are successfully uh, reproducing at advanced age are more likely to reach exceptional longevity. So live childbirth after 40 is a predictor of increased longevity. Okay, now I just described to you two things that go like that. Oh, you mean there's trade-offs in biology? That's how uh. biology works. That's how biology works. So stop saying, is vitamin E good or bad? Is selenium good or bad? Is spay good or bad? Either ornus gets us in trouble. Say, there are trade-offs with everything. So you have to look very carefully and you say, what is the dose of vitamin E? When, in combination, under what circumstances would vitamin E supplements benefit me? But anyway, so now I just described to you that reproduction could be good or bad. And what did we find? It doesn't come at a cost. And in fact, a small number of pups may be actually beneficial more beneficial than having no pups or a lot of pups. But again, not statistically significant, just a trend. But no cost, no cost to reproduction. So, is it, so here's the good news. Let me put it in practical terms. The good news to maybe breeders would be this. You could envision this hideous thing where you would sell a pup to somebody and say, and you know, the most recent research suggests that keeping ovaries around longer increase longevity, and you got a breeder. Uh-oh, uh-oh. It's like, uh -oh. it's like uh -oh. well, to, to have the advantage, right? No, what I just said to you, the paper that will come out, again, it will be published in the journal called Age, which is one of the top-tier aging journals in the world. Not a veterinary journal, not a veterinary journal, but in Age, it will say, independent of number of pups, it's ovaries that matter. So the good news is, see, the golden retriever or the Roddy or whatever should keep her ovaries for four years or six years or some window of time, but she doesn't have to be breeding yeah. in order to get the benefit. What did you find out time-wise? That's just what I was going to ask. Is it four years, six years, seven years yeah, in okay. the dogs that, are, that have been spayed? Yeah, so good. So there's the question that I say, I don't know what the window is. You're, uh, we use the term window. That, that would yeah. be the scientific term. What would be the window of lifetime overexposure that would optimize healthy longevity? That's the, que that's the new question. Not is spaying good or right. bad, right? Or not the stupid question, do spayed dogs live longer? longer. 
Right. Oh my God! If somebody asks you that question, just go like this. Cover your ears <laughs> because <laughs> because right because that remember the ten year old the, the Roddy that was spayed at ten and lived to be thirteen and a half. She spayed by the way, but she had ten years of over exposure. Right. So we don't know what that window is. We don't know it in women. We don't know it in Roddy's. You haven't I had wrote enough a, research. No, no, we want to keep continue to do that. You can imagine that that gets really, really that gets really, really complex to do yes. that. But but I wrote an essay that is published in a veterinary scientific journal. But I bet you guys could read it and make sense of it. And it's called "In Search of a Strategic Disturbance: Some Thoughts on the Timing of Spaying." And what I tried to get across was, can we just agree that ripping endocrine organs out of young mammals is a physiologic disturbance? If we can agree on that, now we can get rid of this, is spaying good or bad, and say, what is the timing of spaying that will optimize health? And in it, I said, if I had to guess, I think that window's closer to six years than six months. I think that's true. For breeds of dogs that would be similar in size, similar in disease spectrum, so, um, so, so not the miniature poodle that has an ACL rupture that won't be crippled by it. The dog will just be picked up more, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and dogs that have a similar cancer spectrum to the Rottweiler, osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma, lymphoma are the three most common tumors of Rotties. And there are other breeds like Mastiffs, Great Danes, Retrievers that have a similar spectrum. I mentioned one dog that I think like the miniature poodle, high breast cancer risk breed. I, 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 I'd be reluctant to say we can extrapolate the data from the Rottweiler to that. Yeah. But, but here, let me be clear. We're in an age of personalized medicine. Not every Rottweiler will benefit from ovaries. Not every woman will benefit from ovaries. That's not how biology works. What we have to do is personalize medicine. But see, we're trapped in this thinking that one size fits all and responsible pet ownership is ripping endocrine organs out of young mammals. That's crazy. That's crazy. Do you have numbers of a, like a percent of the females that have been in your study, whether it be ones that you saw personally or not, that were spayed prior to four or six years, like Kara was yes. spayed at two years. Yeah, so four years of age. So, so we report in, in, our, in the scientific paper that if you spay before four years of age, you erase the female advantage, okay? Now the, the likelihood that the female reaches exceptional longevity is no different than the male. Of course, you put this up on the internet or Facebook or whatever, and then you say, my dog was spayed at six months and lived 190 years. <laughs> right. Look! Males get there. They have no ovaries. We didn't say ovaries are essential. We didn't say ovaries are essential. You could still get to exceptional longevity as a male, and you have no ovaries. What we're saying is, based upon our data, ovaries are part of a system that promotes longevity. If we can keep them around longer, you increase the probability that you reach exceptional longevity. So now, what was magical about four years? Four years is slicing the dogs right down the middle. That was the average age at spay. The reason you report it that way is if I say one year or two year or six year, and I have no nothing to no no reason to back that up, then I'm accused of fudging the data and saying, well, I chose this one cut point or whatever. So what you do is you pick a non-biased cut point. You slice it right down the middle. So when that's what our data showed so what i'm saying is if you had to push me to what my sense is mm, in the roddy six years seven years maybe is probably optimal but again will every female benefit no but see if we're not asking these questions before see how far we've come now we're asking these questions we shouldn't be frustrated that we don't know the window, the exact window. There's that K-N-O-W word. <laughs> it's, it's what do we believe? Do we believe that ovaries are endocrine organs, and it might be beneficial to keep them around for a while? Well, you have to decide what you believe about that based upon the existing information. So 
now that you've talked all about that, anything on diet or just... Okay, so we've collected a lot of information on the questionnaires, as many of you Because I think know. a lot of us are doing like grain-free, we're kind of like yeah, raw so diet. we've collected a lot of information on diet, vaccination. Um, yeah, vaccination. vaccination is uh, something that's on the minds of uh, the Rottweiler community. We had a look, uh, a cursory look through the vaccination thing. Nothing popped out. I wouldn't say that we analyzed that as, as, as completely as we might do. You have to understand there's, there's only so many hours in the yeah. day, so yeah. many resources, and we have to follow the, what we think are the most fruitful uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, lines of investigation. <coughs> in terms of diet, again, nothing that jumps out. Nothing jumps nothing out. Nothing that jumps out, diet or dietary supplements. But remember, that kind of stuff can be really, really complex, yeah. right? Because even if you say, well, I supplement with flax seed oil or fish oil. People are using different products, right, right. different amounts, mm -hmm. in combination with other things. See, that gets really, really complex. The good news, the silver lining is we have these data. We have these data. And so, so again, wh whose work should you fund? You know, when it comes to funding research, the typical way of funding research is project by project. Um, in my mind, that's a nuisance because instead what you should do is you should find the horse you want to bet on and you find the most energetic and open-minded horse. So I see this and now somebody's new data or our new data. Now all of a sudden I leave my previous idea and I go there. You don't want to fund the person who loves their hypothesis so much that is so close minded and say, no, 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 I, I need to do this project. This is the best. Nine out of ten of our ideas aren't going to work. That's how science works, right? If you don't like failure, get out of science and sell shoes, although maybe you can fail at selling shoes. But, <laughs> but, but science is all about failure. I mean, you've got to deal with it. But, but remember, failure is the, are, are the points where you learn the most. And you just have to embrace that and, and then navigate. Okay, so food is complex. How about just plain old vaccinations? Well, I said we looked at vaccination. And it, and, it, and it didn't again, pop out. And it's the same pop. thing. Same with, thing. It's the same thing. Whether different you vaccinated them until they were 10 and 12 or you stopped vaccinating. And, no, so nothing pops out okay. obvious as, as uh, it does uh, hyper-vaccination early in life in the first six months of life okay. uh, have a detrimental effect? What about... Thank you. What about the uh, total number of vaccinations, vaccinations at a late age okay. or whatever? Nothing jumps out. But again, I would, I would, Still I keep would the data. Uh, preface that by saying we've only looked at that in a cursory way okay. because it didn't jump out. Like the ovary story just jumps jumped out. out. And in the living rooms of the people, the <coughs> stress story jumps right. out. And then you say you've got to go after that. If you have a dog, if somebody has a dog at 13 and wants to participate, how do we go about doing this? Or do you still take them? Do or, do you, yes. or, or do you have a lot of them? That yeah, so it's funny. <laughs> uh, at the celebration stop we did in New Mexico with uh, Ann Callahan yeah. and, and her group, we're sitting around the dinner table and somebody said to me, so besides giving you money, how, how could we help you the most? And I had to think about it long and hard, and uh, and we're we're still enrolling dogs in the study. I mean, we're still actively doing that, especially the dogs that are alive, but even dogs that are not alive that have lived to be 13. We want to grow our database. Um, the largest study of a hundred-year-old people in the United States is the New England Centenarian study by Thomas Pearls at Boston University. They probably have 800. Wow. Hundred year old people in their database. Eight hundred. Oh, wow. We've got two hundred and forty one. That's pretty doggone good. Two hundred and forty one canine centenarians, right? Mm -hmm. Dogs that have lived to be a hundred. But getting back to the question, I and what could what could we do that would help you? And here was my answer, and maybe you're gonna think it's stupid. Um, my answer was try to be more savvy on how you handle information, respond to information, gather information, and don't fall into this trap of walking around uh, a, a, a walking, talking anecdote. Well, I do this. Well, I heard that blah, blah, blah. Because you know what? That there's That's noise. And there's so much of that. And I would argue this whole spaying is spaying early health promoting. That was because of noise. 
That's because in the profession it became an act of convenience, and we just did what we were told and trained to do. Until you do research and ask questions and ask the quality of our understanding, then you then you've missed the boat. So in other words, in other words, I would say I don't want you to be scientists, but I want you to try to have a more scientific attitude, meaning, okay, you believe this way. Based upon what? I mean, how good are the data? Of course, you're not trained as scientists, but then you've got to hang out with people who you trust, right? Who can read the scientific paper and say, I was really impressed with that, or this is a really good point, but uh, this one is a little shaky over here. <laughs> but that Siskel and Ebert helped you choose which movies you wanted to see. Who helps you say this is a quality report as opposed to Joe Blow says he feeds X. And so there will always be that, right? There will always be that. We'll share our personal experience. But I don't know. Maybe it was a stupid answer. But I think, I, I think, it, really, I think it really is important. And I, and I know why I answered it that way, because remember, I'm committed to excellence in a research hyphen education space. If I didn't give a rip about educating colleagues or the public, then I'd say, go for it. I mean, do whatever you want, because I'm going to publish a great paper, and I'm going to have a great career, and I'm going to go back in the lab and do something more exciting. But I don't think that's the way you have impact. The way you have impact is you've got to share your new ideas. Mm -hmm. And remember, new ideas will excite certain factions and threaten others. Yeah. You can expect that. You know, mm -hmm. Sir Peter Medawar, who was a Nobel Prize winning immunologist, said this, all experimentation as criticism. That's a great one, isn't it? Because look, you do research in an area because you're dissatisfied with the level of understanding. See, I didn't even use the word K-N-O-W, did I? No. I said, you're dissatisfied with the level of understanding. If I was satisfied what we understood or thought we knew about something here, I'd go do research over here, right? So now, all experimentation is criticism saying, we need to understand this better. Now you do your study, and you now have a new story. But what can you expect? Criticism. Because somebody should then look at your story and say, well, that took us down this road, but it's not the whole story. Perfect. So if you can't stand criticism, again, sell shoes. Don't be a scientist. So I tell, I tell my students, look, research is a process, not a thing. And so when somebody says, what do you do? You say researching. So you put ing at the end of words, and that means process, not things. I'll give a lecture sometimes, and I'll say to, to the, the audience, okay, now go home and tell people that you heard this really cool lecture by this guy, and then I sign my name, David J. Waterzing. Because, <laughs> because I say, see, I'm a process. I'm a process because last week I hadn't read this new paper that has now changed the way I think about something. So... You should think of yourself as a process. You should think of research as a process. Truth with a capital Ring -ring. T is out there. We're trying to increase our understanding Stalling. and get closer. To there you go, Stalling. Good. So if we have a dog that's 13, we... You contact, you contact us, and then we send you a questionnaire. Yeah, I um, and, I then, and then a, a colleague will contact your veterinarian and collect the medical records. And then we'll talk to you as far as uh, can we collect blood and have blood shipped to our and processed at the Murphy Foundation. Uh, and that becomes part of the biorepository that is uh, uh, there. We'll talk about autopsy and maybe adrenal testing and so on and so forth. So, she's living forever. The yeah, money I just yeah. put in her in the past two months. Okay. She's uh, living forever. So exactly. Paula, stuff her and put her on wheels if she doesn't. I am. Exactly. Yeah. Stuff her and put her on wheels. Sissy brother will try to get in there together. <laughs> oh, yeah. Have you found a correlation in any bloodline? Have people yeah, been okay. more fork? All more right, so let's talk. Let's talk about that. So let's talk about the genetics thing. So, um, so uh, if I ask you, what is the heritability of longevity? In other words, if you know how long your parents or grandparents live, how sure are you to how long you'll live? 
So that's called the heritability of longevity. So, okay, students love a multiple choice. So what do you think? <laughs> zero, zero to 20%, 20 to 40, 40 to 60%, 60 to 80%, 80 to, 80 to 100%. Okay, so who says the heritability of longevity is zero to 20%? Okay, no hands. 20 to 40%. No hands. 40 to 60%. Okay, so maybe about seven or eight. 60 to 80 percent. Okay, one and 80 to 100 percent genetics. Okay, the answer comes from human twin studies where you can study identical versus non identical uh. twins. And the correct answer is 25 to 30 percent of longevity is heritable. That's okay, it. so what I just told you, and the word for that in my field is plasticity. There's plasticity to longevity. If the correct answer truly is 70 percent, then all of us health professionals can go take a walk because everybody's genetically hardwired and we're not going to be able to nudge you toward a healthier, more successfully aging trajectory. What I told you is the best news you heard all day. It's only 20 to 25, 30 percent genetics and therefore life decisions are really, really important in terms of longevity. Now, what about exceptional longevity? No doubt about it, the scientists who study 100-year-old people show that exceptional longevity clusters in families, and I'm going to use my words very, very carefully. I'm going to call it familial clustering. In other words, it clusters, it follows families. If your brother lives to be 100, you're 15 times more likely to reach 100 than the average individual. Mm -hmm. That's familial clustering. What did we show in the Roddies? We, sh we took a, a first look at it and showed that if a mother lives to be exceptionally long-lived, the daughter is eight times more likely to reach exceptional longevity. In other words, we showed familial clustering. But remember, when we publish, when we look at the relationship between ovaries and longevity, we do what's called a multivariate analysis. We throw the mother, the familial clustering data in there. And even in the midst, when that's controlled for, the ovary story holds. So, so it's above and beyond yeah. the familial clustering. Now, why should you use terms like familial clustering instead of genetics? Well, I'll tell you why. My sister and I are certainly genetically related, but we eat the same peanut butter because that's how we grew up. And she eats the same peanut butter as me. That ain't genetics. And if it's the peanut butter that causes the pancreatic cancer, then you'll see, see it's genetics. Uh, and I'll say, no, it's peanut butter and it's familial clustering. Yeah. Okay, do you see how that goes? Yes. So, so and There's you so know as variables. well as I, certain bloodlines are genetically related, but then they are fed raw diet, they're vaccinated right. in a certain protocol, right. they're done, they, they do certain exercise regimen, whatever. Okay, yeah, yeah. so the whole point is, there's familial clustering, mm -hmm. and now you got to ferret out what's the genetic part of that and the non-genetic part. I back up and say 25% of longevity is heritable. I'm, at, I'm fishing after that 75%, that other 75% that is plastic. Yeah. In other words, modulatable, because we think we can do something like early life choices, keep ovaries around longer, maybe diet choices, physical activity, mm -hmm. stress, stress, level. stress levels, levels. etc. Right? So we're yeah. going after that that other piece, the 75%. So again, again, can you be more sophisticated in the way you gather information and handle information? Yeah, I think you can. I think you can. And be again, it's language. And that's the that's the thing I'm learning more and more. Poets Poets play with the ambiguity of language. Scientists try to squeeze it out. And as scientists, we're not taught very much about being sophisticated about language. But I, I think if scientists would care more deeply about the language they'd use, they'd see the limits of the scientific method. I just showed you one. Spade are intact at the time of death. Yes. That distorts thinking. So now you say, yeah, but I'm a scientist and I'm going to use the scientific method. Yeah, but your words are screwed up and they're distorting what you're trying to find out. That's language. So if we could be more poet scientists, in other words, not rhyme a lot, but care more deeply <laughs> about language, we'll be better off and we'll recognize the shortcomings 
of our scientific method and that we have to get the language just right. Yep. And that will help our thinking because language is not just communicating, language is thinking. I tell, I tell uh, uh, people that I've met along the way and I'll tell you, the most important thing today is the words that you heard and will take along with you because it's those words that you'll use to think about this subject of successful aging. It's not the facts. It's not the facts that I gave you. So if you go away with windows and yep. plasticity and spade versus intact and those types of things, see, mm -hmm. now you can think about the subject. So when somebody says, did you hear about this? Or you read something new or whatever, that's way more important than the fact that I can give you. Yes? Is it, speaking of the impact of the words in terms of how you conceptualize and work through these questions that I see problems with a lot of the statistical stuff and I'm not a statistician at all uh, with the difference between a correlation and causation okay. and there's this huge jump in so much of the, yeah, the so it reporting either the studies or the reporting on the study that confuses the two and yeah. your peanut butter example I'll give you a better one okay. I'll give you a better one uh, and people, study after study after study after study after study, will show a association, a correlation between drinking alcohol and lung cancer. Why? Because, the people because if you drink, you smoke, or if you drink, you hang out in bars, and there's cigarette smoke in yeah, bars. Secondhand there's smoke. no biological link between alcohol and lung cancer development. But the association is strong and will be there every time. And it's the point that you're making. That's the difference between a non-causal association and something that is causal, right? And and that's one of the things that you have to be aware of. It's like everybody uses toothpaste, and people who die of lung cancer use toothpaste, but the toothpaste didn't cause lung Well, I, I got a better one. I got a better one. Um, lots of people, after their dogs develop cancer, will all of a sudden put their dogs on vitamin E supplements oh, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So now I, I will ask them, okay, so does a dog take any dietary supplements? Yep, vitamin E. Okay, so now what I would do is I would say, cancer, vitamin E, cancer, vitamin E, oh, no. cancer, vitamin E. But see, wait a minute. Causality has to be temporally correct. In other words, oh, in other words the, before I start saying, Oh, the vitamin E and the cancer, it has to happen right. So in other words, the lung cancer can occur before the smoking, if you're going to implicate the smoking, right? It has to be, that's called temporality or being temporally correct. So as of now. You mean this afternoon? Yeah. <laughs> N-O-W. Um, as, as of now. N-O-W, not K N O W. N-O-W. Um, good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You found, you found a, a common thread with a lot of the females that reach exceptional longevity with the fact that a lot of them weren't spayed early. But yet you, you've not found anything like that with the males, right? It, no, it, well, I already asked that really question. Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't well, analyzed. Been when I was over there. <laughs> yeah, we haven't analyzed the males yet because we have too few males. I think we'll have the data by the fall. And then my guess was that. We, we, we all weighed in on it. We all weighed in on it, and we could create three possible stories. Taking away uh, gonads in males early might be beneficial. It might be detrimental. Just because or it of might the stress be a level. Wash. It might be yeah. a wash. Stress, stress level. And, and it's, and it's was the never kind of thing. With his testicles. <laughs> it's the kind of thing, again, I, I, I'm open minded to either of any of those results, depending on what shoots out, and then right. try to make sense of it. And I think that you could tell a story to explain all three results. I think you could. I think you're going to be doing another tour before three more years? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to do... I. I I don't know if I can do a tour every year. You know, I'm teaching a course That's this right, semester. That's right, wait, too. I'm teaching a course uh, <laughs> this semester, and uh, I had to load up the course and then have a 40-day hiatus and then come back and, and now have an intense go at the end of the semester. And uh, um, I want to I meet 100 of these dogs in their homes and then write a book about it. And uh, uh, so I'm motivated to keep meeting dogs. But see, what I do is I play... Uh, in USDA tennis tournaments competitively. So what I'll do is I'll give a t 
talk at the University of Maine, and, and I live in Indiana, so instead of flying, I drive to Maine, yeah. and then I go through Massachusetts and meet a dog, and then I go through Northern Virginia and play in a tennis tournament. Wow, and wow. Go, and I go through Ohio and meet a dog, and then I come home. You know, so yeah. then I get, I, I've got two more dogs, right? Yeah. And so I try to visit, I try to visit uh, as many of the dogs as I can, um, but... But it's different. I, I will tell you, the old gray muzzle tours are so valuable because, and you might, and and it might be, it might be intuitive to you. Like the first trip, 15 dogs in 22 days. You're trying to block out everything else, and yep. you're really see, you're seeing one after the next, and you're asking yourself, what's different? What's the same? What's different? Right. What's the same? And and you, re they really have your attention. Um, the what I described to you, the Maine, Massachusetts, Northern Virginia. All the rest of my job and life are seeping in. Let's put aside that, and and it's a different it's a different experience. I like I like the intensity of the uh, of meeting the dogs, boom, 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 um, and I I think that uh, I think that you're sharper. I think that maybe you see more, right? Mm. This is a stamina issue, as you might imagine. I mean, it, you know, I visit a, I visit a dog for four hours. I get in the car and drive five hours all night long from from New Hampshire to New Jersey, meet the dog the next day, then drive five and a half hours to Virginia. And whatever. I mean, it's it's a stamina issue. And and uh, at the same time, what I have to do is, it's all about the dogs and the serious science. So I can't just be sleepwalking, no mm -hmm. pun intended. I have to I have to be on my game. I've, I'm, right. I'm an investigator, no different than if I was in the laboratory, right? right? And I've got to go into the homes and I'm looking for, and. Uh, and I have prepared, and I know, uh, you know, I say to owners, so, uh, so, uh, has Baron had any urinary tract infections? And uh, the owner's saying, well, I think, yeah, one. I said, yeah, in 2007, and it was responsible for cyclophloxacin. So I know these dogs, right? So I, I know, I know whether they had urinary tract infections, whether they're exposed to radon in the home, tobacco smoke in the home. You know whether the mother lived to exceptional longevity and that kind of thing, but I'm preparing ahead of time so I know the specific questions that we need to clarify and that sort of thing. So uh, it's uh, so I, I think I'll I will continue to meet dogs. I will continue to meet dogs. They're all I I liken them to the Galapagos Islands. If you've ever been there, you go to the first island and you go, whoa, this is off the charts. It's like the moon. Then you sail to the next island and you go, whoa, this is off the charts. It's like the moon, right? <laughs> so each one of these dogs is very very different. I mean, very very different and and uh, and really cool to to meet. What about the attitude of the families? Do you find anything that is the same? Yeah, the common that we were talking a little bit over. We were talking a little bit over uh, there about the commonality. If I had to say commonality, multiple animal households no for sure, and not necessarily dogs, but oftentimes dogs, uh, but goats, guinea fowl, birds, cats, uh, horses, uh, multiple animal households. So. So what does it mean? Uh, maybe that the maybe that the dog, even in advanced age, is part of uh, a social structure. Is is has some sort of purpose. Like or a pack. Something. It's like a, it's a pack yeah, animal. Yeah, has some sort of purpose. Um, and and so and so not very many. So not very many children in the household. Ah, I could have told you that. That's what said. High five. Not very many children. <laughs> And those would be the two. Those would be the two, uh, you know, common threads. Uh, not urban, rural. Not uh, socioeconomic. Not, uh, not a, you know, not, uh, uh, you know, north, south, or right. whatever. So, but yeah, Alaska, multiple animals. Yeah, give me a break. Something. I wouldn't want to be around yeah. for 14 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, that dog lived in Washington State for uh, the first, I think, five years of life, ah. and then and then went to Alaska. Uh, right now, I don't. I'm not home enough to really uh, be a responsible pet owner. But we had West Island White Terrier. Uh, our last dog was Westie. Yeah. Is your next dog gonna be a Rottweiler? As soon as he gets that really longevity to, thing you know, figured out. I really don't need to own any dogs because I get to meet the coolest dogs. I, I, That's I have right. no shortage of cool dogs. Yeah. That's true. Okay, no, no either or. Got that. <laughs> <laughs> no either or. There's any hors d'oeuvres, you can get them out. Mm. Mm.
Yeah, go away with the overs. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, can we have the thing back to put this in? Sure. The tube? The thing. The, the, the thing. The thing. The tube? Yeah. Let me turn it off. Let me turn it off. Yeah. Let me turn it off.